Welcome back for more action in Group B as we're minutes away from Vega Squadron versus Detonation Focus Me. And what a game it's likely to be. Both teams coming off a win in their first game in the group. Yeah, I'm just curious, like, kind of what compositions we're going to have because this felt like the... I don't even know. It was like it was like death from a blow. It was like death from above. It was like death of like a horse <laughs> flying past your screen. It's the death from everywhere comp. The death from everywhere against composition. Against the invulnerability or the what do we say to the god of death, not today composition we saw from Detonation Focus Me. But what wins out there? That's I've, the question. Like, can you kill them before they become invulnerable? I have a feeling that, okay, there's going to be two actions. Okay. So you've seen the Son of Tarek. You know it's coming. In fact, it was actually banned in the second game where the Tarek was denied anyway. So either you leave it open because you know that you have something that can counter it, which if anyone's going to have some sort of crazy bottling... It's uh, going to be Vega. It'll be Vega. Or you just deny it and we see what Detonation Focus Me can throw. That's the question, isn't it? Can Destination Focus Me stall out a game without as many stalling tools as they had in that first game of the day? Uh, it is a dominating return to the stage from them from them across the board. You know, they, that game was pretty one-sided when you actually look at the scoreline and you look at how it played out. Uh, absolutely, and I think a lot of that was to uh, Evie on that Kale yep. performance right there. And he doesn't just need to play something like Kale. It can be anything. He has a, a very versatile champion pool. I think it's better for Detonation Focus Me to put him on a carry-oriented champion because it really unlocks his maximum potential. Um, but again, this guy smurfed in the LJL, uh, and I'm just waiting for him to continue that smurfing on the international stage. That is definitely the hope. We didn't see too much from Boss in that last game. I mean, he had, it was a good Hecarim performance. I mean, I saw him drive by yeah. a couple of times. It was a good Hecarim performance. It wasn't a standout performance, not something like a ruin that we, uh, we saw the other day. But the question will remain, can Detonation Focus Me really get through that first 15 to 20 minutes? And if they do, will Vega Squadron just have a composition that works really well after that as well? You know, this, this comp they just played with the Carthus with the Pike, that's a very strong comp as you get later into the game. And also specifically on No Man's versus Saras, I can't think of like two more different mid laners, um, especially after that, that Syndra performance there. The fact that No Man's, when he saw his opportunity to look for the kills, he teamed up very well with his jungler. Seros is just such a utility mage player. Um, now, there is a sub, I believe, for Detonation Focus Me that they brought with them that, Ramune. that can play uh, the Assassins. He did play a couple of their games in the LJL, so maybe as the tournament goes on, they start to diversify um, their style with different mm -hmm. champion pools, but Seros is just such a mainstay and such a staple of this team it'd be really hard to see him go. Yeah, we only saw Ramune sub in for, I think, five games throughout the regular season. They were all games against teams that Dead Nation Focus Me were expected to beat. So he does have that little bit of extra versatility in his champion pool. But as you say, a Dead Nation Focus Me without Seros doesn't really feel like Dead Nation Focus Me as a team. Uh, Vega, on the other hand, coming off a very strong win in game one. I believe they will be blue side this game as well. Gives you that first pick if you want to look for something a little bit special. You know, something like the Akali, always an, opportun always an option, depending on what we're banning out, what we're picking. Remember, everyone, stand up, do your exercises. Yeah, do your exercises. If you've been sitting down since the start of MSI today, get out of your chair, do a few calf raises, a few exercises. Deep breaths. He's getting the full circuit. You've got, you've got to get your flexibility on, Fox. This is very good ergonomics and very good chiropractic. I respect it. I think we need to take the health of the players much more seriously. So mad props. Stretch it out. Very good stuff all around. Getting warmed up for what is going to be a monumental matchup in the race for first in this group. You have to feel up after the first two games, at least. It looks like Vega and Detonation Focus Me should be the top of the table, whereas INT, Z, and Mega have a little bit more to prove in their game which comes up after this one. Yeah, and again, for me, the big question is, if you take away, if you make them play standard lanes, can Detonation Focus Me still compete? Because it was something that they struggled with in their own domestic region, in the LJL. They gave over a lot of different isolated deaths, a lot of different pieces across the board, um, would step out of position, would kind of take some poor trades and be punished, but you just couldn't overcome their team fighting. And now we've seen them with the team fight comp in game number, or the first game that they played of the day, and it was amazing, but do they get that same power. We will see. Jarvan the first band coming out from Vega. Remember the winner of this game comes out on top of the group at the end of the first day. Halfway, a uh, third of the way through the games in the group as well, being 2-0. and Puts you in a very strong spot. Carthus straight away. Detonation Focus Me say, no, nope, we're having none of that jazz in the bottom lane. We're going to get rid of it in the first ban phase. And again, it's the fact that Vega Squadron, like that Carthus ban, you almost get so much bang for your buck uh, because it's played in so many different positions. It's not just a gadget pick. They can play it in the jungle. They can play it in the mid lane. Um, and he's not the only pick who can do that. And you can tell, Detonation Focus Me, they've downloaded these guys. They know. They're like, get rid of that AD, Nico. I don't want to see it. What's going to be next? Is it Mordekaiser? 
<laughs> definitely done their research. Mordekaiser is an option. Um, they won't ban more. Uh, the, the thing that ban has got through so far, though, is the Heimenegger for Seros. We saw that banned out in the first game. Hasn't been banned out here by Vega, and we know DFM aren't going to ban it out themselves. Oh, but instead, they themselves take away the Tarek. And you are correct, the Heimerdinger is live for Seros. Um, Saros on Heimerdinger, though, I've got a love-hate relationship with it. I think it's just because I hate Heimerdinger. Yeah, I think that's the thing, because he he's a very good Heimerdinger player, but you don't really have to interact with the world when you play Heimerdinger. It's got three towers in front of you and you walk away. Kaiser will be the first lock, so we're not going to see anything spicy out of the bottom lane from DFM. And so far, the biggest takeaway from this draft phase at this point is that both these teams will play the Sona Tarek. I think now this is something that's indicative of Group B. It will very heavily now dictate a lot of these draft phases since we keep seeing this combo broken up. Kaisa and Galio for the side of DFM. That's a much more standard bottom lane. Vega went for the Hecarim first pick. Expect that to be on Boss in the top lane. He's still running Teleport and Ignite. No way! No way! Okay, so I said they wouldn't take it away. There were no Heimendinger games this split for anyone from Vega Squadron. That is a power move. Then you lock in the Shen to round it out. This, this is... This is laying down the gauntlet. This is saying anything you can do, we can do better. And I had the question at the beginning of the day, are we going to see teams just prioritize their own comfort picks, or are we going to see teams really try to download their opponents and have deny? You know, it, it's very rough in these types of tournaments when you have so many opponents to prep for to find these very uh, niche strategies. And it looks like Vegas Squadron, they came fully prepped. They had a great composition in game number uh, one, and now in their second game, they're like, Take all of the uh, all of the power picks away. Do not give this guy Heimerdinger. So here is my expectation from this. Seros picks up the Ziggs as his final pick. I think it's going to be Heimerdinger Shen bottom lane. It I think that's what they're going to play. And then we'll see what Gadget and Santos go for mid, depending on the rest of the picks. I 100% agree with you, because it then also opens up the potential for No Man's to find a good answer into the Ziggs. Maybe something that he can either contest the wave push for, mm -hmm. or at least have kill pressure to open up the rest of the map. Normally, Vega Squadron, a lot of their pivot points starts around No Man's in that mid lane position. Definitely does. And you can see, DFM know it could be like that as well. They're getting rid of the LeBlanc, they're getting rid of the Rise. Vega have taken away the Kindred in terms of jungle picks. We'll see what they decide to ban for their final ban on this second phase. But already, they're looking like a pretty spicy game here between Vega Squadron and DFM. But even though Seros didn't get his, his signature pick, he still has a really strong 5v5 team comp. They're very comfortable on these types of champions. Again, if you're a, a, a DFM fan, these are exactly the types of picks that you wanted to see your team load up. It definitely is. Uh, Lee Sin, the hover at the moment for detonation focus. I mean, Nar was the final bound from Vega, was of course buffed coming into 9.8. Lee Sin for Steel. I haven't actually seen him play this this much this split. You know what's also really cool about DFM's comp is its ability to play side lane. If Evie takes something like a, like a Fiora or like a Kale, like if she's out split pushing, you have the reach of the Mega Infernal Bomb. You have the Galio uh, semi-global ultimate. And then you also have Kaisa who can swing out there with a, a cheeky W into a, an ultimate. Um, that's actually something that could be really interesting depending on what this last pick is. If Evie just goes for like the straight hard carry would be an incredibly intriguing opportunity for them. Vega, though, have the opportunity to match in those side lanes as well. It's going to be corky mid for kind of the push pressure in towards the Ziggs, but with a package, with a Shen ult, with a Hecum, you can run around quite a lot. That's a big carry coming out from the side of DFM, but more of a team fight threat in the form of the Vladimir. And it feels like both teams um, have a lot of tools for the team fight, though. Uh, I do like the dual versatility of Vladimir, that he can play for the team fight, like you're saying, as well as for that split push. So I think that he still gets a lot of value off of the ability to run one for in this composition from Japan. Um, because again, of all of that semi-global threat. Uh, on Vega Squadron, though, I think their skirmish potential, especially between Rek'Sai and Corky on Corky package, is really high. And I think we're in another situation where, you know, it was Lee and Syndra in game number one where you have very clear power windows to play around. Uh, the same sort of vibe here. You got very clear power windows to play around Corky, and I expect Ananasik to uh, plug into those power windows and everything to start with No Man's again. Uh, Ananasik was very strong in a game one, reading his enemy jungler, working out exactly where he needed to be on the map. We'll see if he can do it again into Steel, who had a strong game one performance as well eclectic team comps. A little bit of this, a little bit of that across the board, but I'm very excited to see how these two teams match up against each other, especially with Gadget taking Seros' like signature pick away from him and just being like, okay, I'm going to play this in the bot lane now. We'll see how we'll see how Heimerdinger works. I'm uh, pretty sure he's just going to push. The thing about Heimer is that, um, you know, pending how 
in tune he is with the champion. Shout out to Jat's guide on it. Everyone, if you're not used yep. to seeing Heimer, just pull up that YouTube tab. I'm pretty sure that we did one in the EU LCS with Hyanan as well. There was like a Lolly Sports article about it. So but. you're saying that I'm sponsoring the wrong broadcast right now? Saying, you know, you're part of LEC now, Frost, okay? I watched the LCS one. Pull that up, get a quick tune up. We'll be talking about Heimer over the course of this game because here we go. On to Summoner's Rift, and here we go into a pause just at the start of the game for us. There wasn't really much I could do from there. You set me up into the, the excitement, and then we just calmed it down a little bit. So we talked about uh, early game from an Ananasic and uh, Nomans. They want to play around those corky windows. What are Dead Nation Focus Me looking to do? Is it, again, just them scaling up and playing a slow early game? I mean, they've got a Vladimir, and they have a Ziggs, and they have a Kaisa. So you tell me, Medic. Well, I, see, I know the answer, Frost, but it's just it sounds better if you say. It is about the windows about where they can go aggressive. And there is a, a window for Galio, level three. His all-in is quite contentious. And so if, um, depending on how Steel paths, if he starts top side and he's pathing towards bot side, you know, maybe you look for the uh, the level three Galio with maybe some jungle intervention there. So there are options. Detonation Focus Me could, you know, flip the script, go a little bit aggro in the lane phase, but they're not normally a team that attacks in lane. Yeah, I doubt they'll do it, but you never know. Uh, the ability to surprise and to adapt against teams at this sort of level is incredibly important. On the other side of the Rift Vega, they got a pushing bottom lane, a bit of safety in the form you of... You guys Jen. can't see this, but this poor soul, this play-by-play -play caster is pulling up the uh, names for Heimerdinger's abilities. See, here's the problem, right? I know what I would call them. It's, like, it's mate, the turret, it's, it's the rockets, it's the grenade, it's, it's the, the grenade, upgrade, It's right? the turrets, it's the rockets. That's not what they're called, though. It's the H28G Evolution Turret. It's the Hextech Micro Rockets. It's the CH2 Electron Storm Grenade. I don't know why you've got that weird Brrr, roll happening. It makes it more, more professional, I find. More pop. Uh, yeah, that's what it makes it. <laughs> okay. We are going to jump back onto the Summoner's Rift. It's Fosk and I find what we want to talk about in the early game. Where are we looking? What, what, what intrigues you about this game for us? What intrigues me is how they're going to play around the Heimerdinger. So uh, everyone knows about the push. One of the cool things about Heimer, though, is that depending on how he has his turret set up, he can actually be really hard to gank. I was actually talking um, to a sale about this. I was like, I got to prep my Heimer knowledge. I got uh, DFM on the docket today. Surprise, it's Vegas Squadron playing it. Uh, and that's the key thing, though, is that Heimer is able to soak so much attention if he is a confident Heimer player, because even if you send the jungler down there, depending on how the turret setup is, where the wave is, there may be nothing you can do about it. And he just laughs and walks away. Especially when he hits level six and has upgrade as well. It makes it incredibly difficult for you to deal with him at all. Uh, and Anasik is going to come down towards this red buff. A couple of turrets were placed there by uh, Gadget, so it should be a pretty easy take on the red. Shen's support is not something we too commonly see now, but still very powerful. Was buffed a few patches ago, his uh, Q getting just that little bit of extra damage. And of course, the Taunt is always a powerful spell to have. I believe he had a little bit of an appearance over in the LCK. I know that Santos has also played it, so it's not a, a pick super out of left field, although not necessarily a signature pick. And you are talking about how he had some of his changes, gets a little bit stronger in the lane phase, but really it's uh, it's Gadget doing a lot of power lifting here, uh, making up for the fact that Shin doesn't have the inbuilt wave clear that a support like Galio has with his Q, and instead he's got the Heimer for it. But early on, does need to be quite respectful. I think early on as well, you expect Use One and Gang to be able to push this in, especially with the Akathian Rain. You can just focus down those turrets pretty easily, and that's what we're seeing down towards this bottom lane. Uh, bottom lane. Now, and Anasik is uh, is is around, just around the corner on the Krugs. Could come up and look for a gank. Steel actually missed the scuttle crab there with a the sonic wave. So or zero out of one. Was he checking the bush? Well, there's a ward in the bush, so I hope he wasn't checking the bush. Or it, is, a, it is possible. I'm a glass half full. Yes. Okay. That's all I got. Yeah, I mean, I was going to make a joke about still needing glasses after missing that cue, but I think we'll give him the benefit of the doubt for the moment. Bot lane push in favor of Dead Nation focus me. They'll be happy enough to playing safe as they can down towards this bottom side. All right, top wave, mid wave, we expect them all to be pretty even. A lot of this early game is defined by the junglers, where people want to path, when they want to be looking for these ganks. I think one of the big differences, though, at least in the early levels, is the wave priority that No Man's is going to get with Corky Push versus Saros on the Ziggs. Um, Saros having to expend, I feel like, a lot more mana on the Ziggs to compete with it, which is what you see now, and how that's going to unlock Pineapple there on the Rek'Sai um, to start peeking into Steel's jungle and uh, gathering information or denying camps. I was informed in the break that Ananasik 
has the, the intonation on the second A, a third A, so I'm trying to do it. I apologize to any of our listeners uh, who say are Say it really fans. slow. Ananasic. Ananasic. That's how I'm going to try and say it. I apologize to any fans who believe that is just mispronounced. I'm trying my best, I promise. I could just say pineapple, which is uh, what Foskuren has decided to do. I actually think it's a pretty good... I know when I'm beaten and I just have to disengage. I cannot blame you. Evie here in the top lane gonna just farm up this minion wave. Boss force back has the teleport though, it can't get just back in. Gonna TP in. Steel will actually have an opportunity to look for something here. There's no wards up towards that top side. And if Steel wanted to, he could actually threaten boss a little bit. With no flash on the Hecarim, after you've used your teleport, getting a kill now would be very bad. You've got flashes board here. Captain Man comes out. Gadget ignited, doesn't have the heal. Just about surviving with the potion. Gadget will stay alive in that bottom lane. And Detonation Focus Me burn all of their summoners and they'll only get the flash and the teleport out from Gadget. And unfortunately, it doesn't feel like they're going to deny anything from the Heimerdinger. He also has the teleport. Um, he should just be able to teleport immediately back into the lane and grab this huge wave. So it's not like they even get the advantage of denying him gold or experience. Do not lose anything at all. Very aggressive play there from DFM. We wondered if maybe they'd switch things up a little bit. Well, that's the kind of play you want to see them making if they're going to get an early lead. And we did talk about, you know, uh, Galio as a support, why you pick a Galio versus an Alistar when it feels like they can do very similar things. And one of the cool things is that uh, all-in level three potential, whereas Alistar, you know, it's kind of about the level two. Galio also gives you the ability to fight more into the river with the ultimate, whereas Ali's more about uh, the dive potential uh, with his ultimate. So small differences in how you're going to execute, which with what are both tanky playmaking supports. With Steel down towards this bottom side as well, and then maybe they can catch out Heimerdinger on uh, Gadget on that Heimerdinger. It's definitely a possibility with there being no flash, no upgrade yet, no level six on that bot laner. Here we come, Steel. Trying to just pass forward, but Gadget knows something's up. He's playing incredibly safe and we'll just get that ward in the tri-bush. And you know that they really wanted to make this gank work uh, because they needed to punish the flash. Yeah, they needed to punish the flash down towards the bottom lane, but they aren't quite able to do it. Steel is actually a couple of levels behind because he has spent so much time just trying to look for those gags, trying to look for those plays. Sorry, and I had fantastic. something stuck in my throat. That's okay, it's okay. You can pull it out now, you good? Had some water. Okay, you have a, have a little sip before we go move on with the game. Two level advantage for the uh, for our Nanasic on that jungle backside. And uh, with him being so far ahead, you have to think he'll be looking for a little bit of a, a play, a little bit of a game. You can see him play used there in the top lane by Evie. Not really going to have too much of an effect, just using it to clear out the wave as quickly as he can. He gets a free um, back, however. I think Boss is going to try to force him to use the teleport. Yeah, he's like, he's in the creep wave, swirkling his baton. I don't know what swirkling is. <laughs> Swirling his swirling. baton. He's swirling it around. The teleport will come out from Evie. And detonation focus me. And Vega Squadron. Pretty much odds even. Even across the scoreboard at the moment. It's about a 10 CS lead down towards that bottom lane, but that's not, nothing really too impactful for the DFM team. I think right now both teams pretty, should be pretty happy with how things are going, right? Like you're both scaling up, you're in good position. When we start to see no man's roaming around the map with that package, that's when Vegas Squadron will really come online. And Detonation Focus Me, you're looking at two, three completed items before this team's at its full capability. And I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of their playmaking potential, because they did expand their summoner's bottom, uh, is now kind of around Steel getting access to level six. Um, which he's trying to power farm for it right now. I think he's, he said, oh, hold on. Not used by Gang down towards the bottom lane. The Ignite comes onto Udipon. One more auto attack would have been enough, but Udipon is able to get away. You can see that was Santa splashing forward. And as much as Steel might want to power farm towards level six, the push pressure in top lane, the push pressure in bot lane allows Anana Six to come in here and steal away the red. So Vega really doing what Mega couldn't in game number one, which is punish the scaling lanes. Again, the fact that Detonation Focus Me expended so many summoners trying to make that kill into the bottom lane work, uh, it makes it much harder to go aggressive like this. They're trying to find their, their chunk trades, but you know, they're pushed under their tower. Udupon can't follow up. He doesn't have the health. And again, Steel was like, I need to get level six. If I can't get level six, maybe I try to force this one out but if this doesn't work you're falling further and further behind looking for the hard force here as he comes right behind the vega squadron but the, the evolution did toys. he block that he did, with the did. tower the turret comes down blocks it and this is one of the things you can do like it's you can do it also on a zyra if you put your plant down just in time you can block any projectiles any skills coming in it's good play from gadget shows that he knows his way around heimerdinger 
I'm impressed. Kyle was impressed. I'm impressed. And again, we said that Steel is just going to fall further and further behind because that's him then looking for things like this gank instead of farming. Just styled on him. Yeah. Looked him straight in the eye. Was like, I dare you. <laughs> Come on, mate. Come on. You, you get the turret. It's free gold. It's free gold. Free real estate down towards this bottom lane if you want it, but not going to be able to do too much about it. And Anasek now going to steal or oh, oh, take away this Ocean Dragon. Eight minutes in, Vega Squadron, everything coming up in favor of them. And, you know, this is kind of the... Uh the spillover of these small advantages that Vega have built in the lane phase. The fact that you were talking about the priority that both Nomads and Boss have, you know, very far forward in their lanes. The fact that Steel appeared on the map at level five and was just like hard alpha by Heimerdinger there, denying the engage. So he needs to go back and farm and it opens up a free ocean. I'm with it. Uh, vision control of the river as well. Nomads trading into Seros here in the mid lane. Seros has gone heal once again on the on the Ziggs just for a little bit more sustain, can dodge out some of the bursts from No Man's. But something we commonly see from Corkies in mid lane is they, they'll go for the Hex Drinker into a mage matchup because they know they can get burst down. Into things like the Syndra, into things like the Blanc, you need that extra magic resist. Here, No Man's saying, no, none of that. Don't need a Hex Drinker. I'm going full Triforce first item, get that extra damage, get towards that one item power, and then maybe can look at a bit more defense later on if he needs it if he needs it and uh, he's done a really nice job sidestepping a lot of these bombs from Saros. It feels like Saros's wave clear has been uh, really put on just trying to focus on the minions as opposed to trading for the Corky. So good positioning and lane from No Man's. And as much as you know we are praising Vega for their early game here for their ability to you know push Dead Nation Focus Me a little bit behind it's still only 100 gold between the two teams. So Dead Nation Focus Me haven't had as many leads as they want, but maybe they're going to get eight kill here in the top lane. Steel falls down. A boss and an Anasik in the right position at the right time will take out that jungle. I mean, there was a lease in there, and then suddenly it was just direct side. Just Whoa. instantly dive. Disappeared off the face of the Summoner's Rift. No man's forced back. They're going to dive Saros. The they can just dive him, as you say. No one's stopping one slot for boss, but an Anasik there with the flash. There's the Stand United as well. Mega Inferno Bomb's not going to be enough. And then Anasik will take the kill. Just super clean cross-map play from Vega Squadron. They're now just going to get a huge chunk out of this tower, pick up a lot of these plates, and deny so much golden experience to Saros. So again, Vega doing what Mega could not, which is punish Detonation Focus Me in these lanes. You cannot just draft passive and get away with it. And I love what I will call a timing attack. That's what they're doing. They're waiting for a specific item point. They're waiting for a specific level here, the Shen level six, before they make these plays, before they can go for that really aggressive play. Vega Squadron seems to be a team that know exactly when their windows are, exactly when they are just that little bit stronger than their opponents and when they can strike. And just credit to Boss here. This is a guy who walked into Krugs, helped kill Lee Sin, walks it into the mid lane, also picks up the assist here with uh, Saros dying, and then teleports back into the top lane. Didn't even miss a beat. He's not even behind. Well, he is behind, but he didn't miss anything in that room. That's yeah. what's important. He was already a few CS behind, and he has, that hasn't extended. He had he the wave pushing into him. I'm just going to remind everyone, due to a morning period taking place in Vietnam, Group B will play their last eight games and any eventual tiebreaker games on the 5th of May, which is in three days' time, I do believe. A little while, so make sure you tune in when that happens. But for today, we still have one more game after this one. Make sure you stay tuned. It's going to be fun. All of the games in Group B have been a little bit more measured, I'm going to say, a little bit more scaling on the teams than we saw in Group A, but still, both teams in this matchup aware of their surroundings, aware of exactly what they need to do to try and get in this game. It feels like so far we've had a lot more uh, kind of like strategy checks than yeah. skill checks. Maybe our first fight. Oh, he, oh, he steals it away, but the Hemo Plague and the final auto attack from Selvas is enough from Ananasic uh, to take down Ananasic. Now, do you greet for it? Do you go for the Rift Held? Both Boss and Santos can get can in just there. Run in and the, yeah, Boss is just running in. Devastating charge onto Steel. They're looking for the fight, but here's the hero's entrance. Detonation focus me, trying to bait out the play. Double taunt lands. Sells there with a the hexplosive in mind. Santos goes golden. Unstoppable onslaught from Boss gets him away. Santos trading onto Steel could just ignite him. Evie's going to take down No Man's, but Santos gets the kill. Just go for it, man. You're going to die anyway. He gets the Rift Held. Satchel charge knocks him back, and eventually he falls to Sells. Evie chased away Boss down towards the bottom side, but the Rift Held does go over to Vega Squad. That was Detonation focus me like. Who's the captain now? We dare you. Come get it. In the end, they did walk away with it. Steel has smite up. I'm looking. I was like, I saw that he still had his smite. I was it's like, a maybe. Two level disadvantage. Maybe it just came up. 
two level disadvantage when it happens. So it's uh, can't really blame Steel too much for losing it. The impending fight, though, good disengage from Steel here. Uh, and then they get him into a nice choke point. Ziggs really loves choke points. He's able to walk in freely and then oh. like dunk. Speaking of dunked. Yeah, and Anastic just comes in with the claws in the mid lane. So us. Unable to survive that heal, not helping him, not off cooldown. And it's going to be a couple more plates you have to feel. Might even be just first power going down. Rift Herald was summoned. Uh, that is in the mid lane, but the turret's going to fall before he even gets a charge off. Oh, maybe just one? Oh! oh, oh. It doesn't take any damage, so now they can continue to push. Gang comes into the mid lane to try and defend. Shen's here as well as Santos comes up from the bottom side of the map. Double taunt lands. It's only Santos who's taking up the tower, still jumping in. They've just wanted a little bit of chip damage onto this tower. You know, it's down to about 10% health or so. It's very good stuff from Vega, opening up the map as much as possible. No, it's massive, especially when you have a champion like Corky and uh, Hecarim on your team. If you're able to get that far down in the mid lane, it gives you that much more access into the jungle. Usually that uh, goes into Baron setup, as we see how this uh, this play started. It's a package play. It was a package play. <laughs> Knocks back Seros, then the Prey Seeker hits, and, huh. uh, and Anasik can just jump all the way across. Weren't you just crediting Vega how good they are about recognizing their windows, yep. where to strike, how it was going to be about the package window with No Man's and uh, Ananasik? I mean, you, you, you set it up in pick and ban, so I'm not going to steal away all the credit, but yes, I'm amazing at predicting plays. It was all you, Medic. Thank you very much. So, Four kills to three in favor of Vega Squadron. A 3,000 gold lead for our team from the Commonwealth of Independent States. And they're opening up the map. They're taking that mid lane tower. They're actually taking a Cloud Drake right now as well. It's the second dragon of the game. And Detonation Focus Me, they are still scaling. Storm Razor into Pickaxe on Utapon will get him that Ikathian Raid upgrade. You have a Ludens now finished on Seros. You're starting to build towards a Proto Belt on Evi. But when you compare the early games, Vega Squadron got 1,120 gold from Plates. That nation focus me got 160. I just. It feels like we're going to say the same thing about Detonation Focus Me, which is they're still scaling. And at some point, that's either going to be good enough or it's not going to be good enough. Um, I still like what Vega have put together because I feel like, especially with a Corky, their scaling potential and their 5v5 potential is also very strong. Now, that can't deny just, you know, like a sick wombo combo from DFM. Like, say you get the Hemo Plague, you spread that around, make that real nice, and you just, like, drop a Ziggs Bomb on top of it. Kais is just flying around. That feels good. But if you don't get that, then Corky's just going to shred you in long extended fights. Hecarim's going to shred you in long extended fights. I'm not sure what Heimer's going to do, but I'm sure... His turrets will shred you in long extended fights. It'll be flashy. Yeah. Chucks a big electron grenade across the, across the team and uh, can get that stun long. Heimer's actually a pretty long range CC bot if you use him effectively as well. Now, Dedication Focus Me have brought Steel down towards this bottom lane, trying to do something about Gadget and Santos who are continuing to push in. There's not really too much they can do because what another thing Vega have been very good at doing is being aware of when they could be too far forward, when they could be ganked. And I've never really, well, rarely seen Vega step too far forward when an enemy jungler might be on their side of the map. Hold on now. Evi caught out a little bit, goes into the Sanguine Ball, pops a Hemo Plague as well, but he's forced back behind his tower. Not really going to be able to do too much here because Lee Sin down towards that bottom side. We talked about it in the last game. It's weak versus strong side of the map. If you have more players down towards box and you're sitting up at the top side, you're not on the strong side of the map. You need to be careful because the enemy team can just collapse on you. Now, Steel trying to get in, dodges away from the kick, knocks him back, Gadget there. The double taunt comes out, the teleport used as well, but they don't really have the damage to catch out Vega. Evie came in with a TP, Gadget flashed away. Meanwhile, in the top lane, Mega Inferno Bomb actually landing here. There's the Tides of Blood from Evi. He'll get the kill with the Proto Belt. Santos underneath the tower, surviving for a very long time. But as soon as this minion wave comes in, Santos is a goner. Winds of War into a final transfusion from Evi. will get them the double. They'll look for the tower down here in the top side of the map, though. Vega have taken two towers and are pushing towards that in here. And that's the thing. It's not worth it for Detonation Focus Me. Vega gets so much access. That's now both inners down in both mid and top lane. Baron will eventually be a part of this game. And Vega are going to have so much control over this area. Look at the level disparity between the junglers still as well. Usually you see the uh, junglers behind catch up as the game progresses. He's two levels behind Ananasic. It's 11 to 9, which means Ananasic also has the level 2 ultimate. No man's at level 12. Very powerful picks here on the side of Vega. And you're, now that you've seen that first item spike come in, we're looking towards that second item. As soon as you get the Trinity Force, uh, the Infinity Edge, sorry, on No Man's, he's going to be so strong. Spirit Visage on boss makes it so much easier for him to deal with Evie. 
you have to feel when you get that next item, Vega are going to be unstoppable if they take this fight. And it feels like the weight of the world is on Evan's shoulders, that it's how quickly can we get this Vladimir up, because he can be a real terror in these fights, as well as try to hold down the uh, one of the side lanes there. But you are correct. It feels like there is a bit of a power trough for Detonation Focus Me, and they're just trying to race against the clock and say, okay, Baron spawns in 1 minute 30. There's also a, a dragon that's going to come out. We're going to grab as much farm as safely as possible for this next like minute and a half, and then hope that we've collected enough gold to piece together a team fight here. Evi was one of the big performers uh, for Detonation Focus Me at the World Plane in 2018. You know, we saw him playing things like the Urgot, playing things like the Camille, doing a lot of work. He does have access to his Zhonyas now, so he's just completed that, and that's actually massive for these team fights. So again, if you're looking at key items, having that means he can go so deep here. Still jumping in, but only kicks away. No man's couldn't get behind him. That nation focused me with all five men strong down here towards the bottom lane. You can see Boss is just still pushing in the top, getting the waves forward. It's only the inhibitor tower remaining, and Vega feel confident enough to step up here in the bottom side. Looking for that tower will put down the turrets, but for the moment, won't get too much. It's actually really nice from Boss. He walked into Fog of War to pick up the red buff, and basically he was saying, if Vladimir's still down there, um, then I'm going to continue to push top. Since Vladimir has shown, I can now decide where I'm going to rotate. Maybe I pull the trigger on the TP. Maybe I actually just run there, because they know that they're cheating and have an advantage towards bot side. Here he comes. All the way down from the top side of the map. It's Notion Drake up in seven seconds as well. Having five members strong down towards this bottom side will help. So it falls. It's the final outer tower of the game for Vega. Only one tower remains outside the inhibitors, and that's in the bottom lane for Detonation Focus Me trying to defend. But Vega Squadron, they're, they're kind of calling out Detonation Focus Me. They're saying, okay, guys, if you want to team fight us right now, you can take it. But we think we're stronger. We think we're taking the whip. And they've also now got double ocean. And for a, a composition that has the ability to play side lanes um, with the Hecarim, as well as just kind of park the Heimerdinger and never move him for mid lane, ocean can mean so much because he'll never have to go back into base. It's actually a really cool dragon spawn for this comp specifically. Double ocean in the cloud. 5,000 gold lead for Vega as we press that 20 minute mark. Infinity Edge now finished on the core key as well. If you ever see a team fight erupt, you have to be aware of those missiles of that Phosphorus bomb because that Corky will shred through you. And he can even be in a side lane because he's got the teleport, because he's got the package. He can be another threat in a 1-3-1 one, one if you want him to be. Heimer holds mid, Boss goes down towards the bottom side, and you see No Man's up towards this top side just pushing in the waves. And Vega has done a really good job, not just uh winning on the map, but making sure that they're also picking up all of the available farm. They've gone really far down the lanes, but you can see CS advantages uh, virtually in every role, especially in that jungle as well. And that was after Detonation Focus Me were ahead in terms of CS in the laning phase. Vega doing a great job between probably about the 13 to 20 minute mark. I think they've really come into their own. Now, next steps, you're looking at deep vision. You're looking getting some of these wards in. You can see Vega Squadron have kind of started to step their vision up, started to get a few a few wards here in the jungle, but it's not deep enough for me. When you get towards that Baron, you need to be getting wards around the red pit, around the entrances to that jungle. And I agree with you. I think that that was just kind of some leftover vision when they were moving up there uh, initially, and this was more about kind of the reset to grab all of the two item power spike across multiple members. And now it's about wait until boss has pressure pushing forward, then we can start this uh, denial game or pick game that they're starting to posture for now. Steel in the bush on the control ward. No man's will spot him out with the phosphorus bomb, but so far yet to see Vega really step that vision line up. Now, get the mid prio, get the top prio, and push it forward. Yep, so you can see it exactly. They've now got this pushing forward. Oh, this is fun. This pushing forward, which means now it's all about this Baron. Going for the Baron there. I will clear the screen for you, Foscoon. It's a new tool to play for, and they've started up the Baron. 6,000 HP on it. Yeah, he's going to put in a ward, spot it out. Seros on his way as well. Has that Mega Inferno bomb, could look for the steal. Triple turrets in there. And Anastic looking for the smite. The Baron is going to be taken. No way of stealing that one away. And it is Gadget who secures it. Vega Squadron, 23 minutes in with a Baron at their backs and a 7,000 gold leader looking to top the group. I mean, they had the experience advantage, 13 to level 10. They had the gold advantage. You just talked about that massive gap there. But then they also had the cherry on top, the fact that it's a Heimerdinger of all things. And one of the cool things that Heimer does bring to team comps is his ability to shred and uh, force down Baron. Sets up his tournament and it's just free. 
Great stuff there from Vega Squadron. And as you like, it's so easy for them to take it, as you say. Now, with the ability for Corky to be in the side lane, with Boss being so strong, Spirit Passage complete on this Hecarim. There's no real way, even though Ebi is pretty powerful, you know, he's sitting on a needlessly large rod, on a Frodo Belt, on a Zonia's, probably not going to be able to work his way through the Hecarim. Don't underestimate the power of the Wombo combo. Again, at this point, we said the last composition that DFM did, they couldn't press all of their buttons all at once. They wanted to kind of stagger them apart, really chain together those cooldowns. This one, just throw it all down. Just hit it all at once as long as the Hemo Plague is on them. But that means that Vega Squadron would need to be grouped for it to work. And frankly, Vega have done a really good job not grouping up. They're splitting apart, they're uh, pressuring multiple points on the map, and they're using the mobility of their composition with that core key and that Hecarim to deny that sort of wombo from DFM, because that's the only way back. Yeah, often you also need an engage tool, a hard engage tool for a wombo like that to really be as effective as you want. Maybe with the Galio, maybe with the Lee Sin jumping into the backline and a kick into a hero's entrance, you have that, but it's nowhere near as secure as something like a Sejuani, as something like a Lissandra who can just jump straight on towards that backline. A little bit of a slowdown here, though. They're really playing this one patiently, Vega. That they are, but they can. You know, they've still got two minutes basically on that Baron power play. Heavy force back here. The upgraded Electron Storm Grenade comes out, makes him pop the Sanguine Pool, and that makes it a lot more difficult for him to stand beneath the tower. But the rest of Dead Nation Focus, we are here just defending with him. I also really like how they're using Santos on the Shen. You know, normally you'd see your top laner uh, and your mid laner being the ones responsible for pushing the side lanes, but because he has Stand United, it's actually the support that's feeding in that mid lane, allowing Hecarim to really threaten the dive potential um, so that Heimer and Hecarim and Rek'Sai can approach that tower and push it over. It's making the most efficient use of your resources, and that's what we've seen from Vega Squadron across the last couple of games. They are, just seem to be able to understand their opponents, understand their own composition, and play, I'm not going to say perfectly, but play pretty darn well so far. I really liked them. I, I saw some sentiment around this team that, again, they felt that you know, they only won because they had like the weird cheese picks, that they abused the meta, that they weren't really the better team. But, you know, if you go through Gambit twice, which they did not only in their playoff run, but also in the uh, open tournament that the TCL holds, um, you beat Elements Pro Gaming, you were a consistent thread to the top of the ladder, and you do it because you have so much creativity and versatility in your drafts. I'm like all about big. I think they're a very cool team. And a pretty uh, new team on the block as well. You look at it, in terms of playoff appearances, you got three on Boss, a couple on Anasic, a couple on the Gadget, three on No Man's. Santa's probably the most experienced player. He's the only guy that's played internationally as well on Virtus Pro in uh, MSI 2017. So this is actually a, a strong showing for a new Commonwealth of Independent States team. Also speaks volumes about the strength of the region, the fact that we've got so many different looks from the CIS with all of those different teams, uh, with you know the Albus Knox Luna quarter as the cherry on top. A lot of fun to watch so far, and looking like they are going to top the group at the end of the first day of Group B, looking like the standout favorites take uh, Flash Wolves take on Flash Wolves in their best of five. Not over yet, Medic. Well. Yeah, it's not over yet. I totally agree. But I think if they win this game, they're definitely the favorites of the group, considering Dead Nation focused me beat out Mega earlier on today. Now, Vega, Baron buff has fallen off. You can still push forward. Haven't quite broken that inhibitor line yet, but Dead Nation focused me are defending for the time being. They do have pretty good wave play, you know, a Vladimir, a Ziggs, and a Kaiser can keep you at bay for quite a while. They're also doing a good job um, scouting with Vision as well as scouting their side lane. So you can see that Evie is trying to look for the flank. That's normally how Vladimir wants to approach these team fights. Get into the side because it's much harder to run front to back, especially through Vega's composition. Um, whereas No Man's was kind of scouting top side of the map and then rotated up to get a lot of damage on this top tower. And then they have really nice defensive vision underneath them uh, on the bottom side of the map to try to catch out that Vladimir. Vega just continuing to keep every single lane pushed forward. The nation focus me, you know, you can keep defending for a while, but when you've got a rapid fire cannon on the Corky every now and again, he'll just step forward. There's the upgraded Electron Storm Grenade. Sebos uses the heal, but this tower's gonna fall, and the base has been broken open by Vega Squadron. But no inhib to speak of yet, so it looks like it's gonna be a second Baron rotation here for Vega Squadron. So hope's still alive for Detonation Focus Me. But the good thing about this is as well. As they retreat out, Vega Squadron have put some wards into the jungle of Dead Nation Focus Me. They'll take their time, they'll move forward and clear it out, but it means when Vega Squadron come back, they can... Oh, teleport away there from No Man's. I think he could have got out, 
with a recall. I mean, it was on a control ward. He was just thinking better safe than sorry. Yeah. I understand that. You don't want to die at this point. You maybe give a, a Baron over to Detonation Focus. Me and how much have you needed that teleport throughout the course of the game as well, I think is a pretty strong question. And how much will you need it if you take the Baron now? Probably not that much. There's also multiple teleports, not just with the Stand United, but the fact that they're running a triple teleport team on uh, Heimerdinger as well, although split pushing with Heimer. A bit of a different animal. <laughs> It'd be uh, pretty difficult, but you can always team him up with like an Anasik and. Once again, we see Vega Squadron go straight towards the band. Farsight Alteration used to spot them out. There's a double taunt teleport coming in from EV as well. They're looking for the fight. Vega Squadron have turned off the Baron, but it's still aggroed by the turrets. They can turn back whenever they want. Steel jumping forward, misses the Sonic Wave. Vega Squadron go back towards the Baron. It's still being aggroed. Steel needs to get in there. Once again, a turret comes down. This is good from Vega. They're just keeping it ticking over, ticking over. They can stop that whenever they want, and that's what they've done now. The turret dies and Vega Squadron will just retreat. Boss is going to go down towards the bottom lane. He has the teleport. There is no teleport on Detonation Focus Me. Because it's about rinse and repeat. What they were playing for there was the summoner spell from Evie on the bot lane, which they got out. So now it's Boss walks down to the bot lane. He's going to force us all the way up. He's going to pressure the tower, and he's going to make Detonation Focus Me make a very hard choice. Either you will stop me from taking your bot in him, or you will stop this Baron. Here's the choice I think they're going to make. I think they will say, we'll go towards the Baron, and then we'll Mega, Super Me uh, Mega Inferno bomb the wave when Boss brings it up towards that inhibitor line. Use that ultimate to clear it out. Seros will go down towards it to make sure the inhibitor doesn't die, and then Detonation Focus Me will be forced to make a play. Haven't used it yet. Hoping my prediction will be right, but Evie instead backs away and is going to try and defend. What I think they're going to try to do is save the uh, Ziggs ultimate with the steal from Lee Sin. That makes sense as well. However, they have lost inhibitor tower because they didn't clean out the wave. Boss is there. Unipom was coming in from the side as well, but now Vega can just turn back towards their band. They can start it right back up. Gang forced away. Steel, so squishy as well. Hasn't even completed his black cleaver yet. This game was forced so far behind by Ananasik. It's a three-level disadvantage on that Lisa. The other advantage of having Heimerdinger means that you don't need multiple damage threats on the Baron, so I believe it's being two-manned right now. Oh, it's definitely helping out quite a lot. Detonation focus me. I think they've given this one up. I think they said we can't do it. This is beautiful setup on Baron from uh, Vega Squadron. Mega and Photobomb comes out, but it's going to be way too early. 1,000 HP left on the Baron. Vega Squadron going to take it. Beautiful setup, as you say. There was no way Detonation Focus Me could get anywhere near the Nasher. The fact that they were super patient, recognizing that Detonation Focus Me were probably going to look for a desperation play since, bo uh, since Boss was pressuring bottom. They backed off. They played to their control wards. They slowly swept everything out, forced Detonation Focus Me out of the jungle, and then went for the two-man. It does not get crisper than that. And as much as we talk about DFM having the wombo combo, having the scaling, I love that. That is so cool. Way. That's like everyone else is playing 3D chess at best, maybe 4D chess. That's 7D chess. Like that's a few layers above everyone else in this game. Pass the triple tower in. They'll take the Cloud Drake, fifth dragon of the game for Vega. I was about to say, you know, Dead Nation Focus Me, they have a scaling comp. You've got Kaisa now on three items. You've got almost three items on your Ziggs. You've got three and a half items finished on Evi. But when you're 11,000 gold behind, the stat check gets harder and harder. Gang caught out a little bit here. Everything's going in. Triple Hemo played, but the rest of the team isn't there. There's no Wombo for this combo. Vega Force back. You can see Steel Solo and Anasik just passes him out. The taunt comes out though from Gang. Unipom jumps onto the back line. Top side though. Void Rush comes in from Anasik and already two members of the Edge Focus Me are down. Unipom chased out by Boss. It's a wipe. They are clean aced Evi. There's nowhere for him to go. He's stampeded over. And Vega Squadron will top group. They make their statement right there. They clean house, like you said, and you could see what Detonation Focus Me wanted. They said, we must fight. We're not just going to watch ourselves lose this game. So they took a gamble, but it was too little too late. From minute one, Vega Squadron ran this game. Vega Squadron totally demolished Detonation Focus Me. There wasn't a moment, really, that you thought DFM had control of this matchup. They will take the win. They'll 2-0 for the first couple of games of this group. They'll even kill Steel on the fountain. Vega Squadron show us that the Commonwealth of Independent States have come to play. And not only that, they look like favorites and heavy favorites. That's incredible performance from them all round. As you say, there were a few people doubting them, a few people saying, you know, is it only the Heimerdinger picks, is it only the Carthus picks? But if it works that well every game, I don't think it matters what picks you're getting. And again, the fundamentals are clean. 
you know, that wasn't just about the cheese, Carthus, or the Heimer, or having them in these weird positions. That was about super clean Baron setup. That was about recognizing when your power windows were, who you were going to play around. So uh, I think Vega are the real deal for this group. I think if you put them on standard League of Legends, that they would thrive just as well. I think they would as well. We'll have to see if a team is able to push them towards that. I want to give a lot of credit to Ananasek. That game, he was three levels ahead of Steel in the jungle. He totally dominated his jungle matchup and it's what set Vega up for so much success. I mean, I feel like you could pick a different member at each That's point of the game. The fact true. that like Boss rocked up to Lee Sin on Krugs, killed him, rocked up to mid lane and was like, I'm gonna help kill you too. And then teleports back to his top lane. Like, yes, he fell down in this uh, individual 1v1 CS, but you know, Boss had his moment. Ananasik was solid for the entire game. No man's on the Corky, like just, Throw a rock, you'll hit someone, they deserve a mention. Now after the break, we're actually gonna have a chat with Santos to see what he has to say about Vegas 2-0 start. It's gonna be great to watch. Look at that gold golf, steady climb. This is what we always talk about. That's what you wanna see. And although, you know, Evie did step up, step up, he had a very good performance. I think he only died once right at the end of the game. It wasn't enough detonation focus me. They didn't have enough in the tank to take down Vega. And they did try to play for the lane phase, you know, around that level three with the Galio Kaisa all in. And unfortunately they went for it and it just barely wasn't enough. And it felt like once they lost their summoners that they just had nothing else to play around. Or at least Steel wasn't going to push on anything. And Steel has just felt frankly invisible to me. And you can see that in the damage. 3.1K on the Lee Sin. He wasn't getting uh, any priority for his lanes. He wasn't able to contest the jungle. I think he really needs to reevaluate how he's going to attack this matchup. He definitely does. And how he's going to attack the rest, attack the rest of the matchups in the group, of course. Almost half, uh, almost through that first round, Robin. I believe they've only got uh, INTZ left to play for Detonation Focus Me. So have to see how they develop, how they adapt. They do have a couple of day break now to really work out what they're going to change strategy wise. Yeah, but it's still a wide open group. You know, anyone yeah. could take anyone down. We haven't done the second round, Robin. And in fact, I think we're going to finish the first round, Robin, in our next series. No, we're not. We have to get six games through to finish the first round, Robin. Oh, damn. Yeah, each team plays three games. I'm so sorry for us. It's okay. Yeah, so it'll be halfway through the next uh, four games that will finish that first round, Robin. We are actually going to see the other two teams play, though, in our next game. It's going to be a mega up against INTZ. Any any thoughts going into that matchup? Uh, I think I need both the junglers to kind of really show their true potential. I had a lot of high hopes coming for both Shinyi and June coming into this tournament, and they looked like completely different animals. So I don't know if it's like stage jitters. I know uh, June very new to the roster. Uh, Shinyi maybe getting yeah. his feet wet on the international stage, trying to shake it off, but hopefully for the next game, it's much cleaner. It's going to be a matchup of the junglers with taking a break for now, but after the break, Mega face off against INTZ. We'll see you then. And Anasik there with the flash. There's the Stand United as well. Mega Inferno Bomb's not gonna be enough. Void Rush comes in from Anasik and already two members of the Stand broke from the are down. Unibon chased out by Boss. It's a wipe. They are clean aced Evie. There's nowhere for him to go. He's stampeded over.